It's November 17th, 2016, and we're on our way westbound in Chernobyl's deaerator corridor, this gold paneled hallway on the 10 meter elevation. Ultimately on our way to the <laughs> central hall or the reactor hall of the unit two. Uh, here is unit two's control room on the left. We just passed its doors. We are going to try to ride the elevator up to plus 20 meters where the central hall is located. And that may not be the best idea because it is a beater. And it drops. <laughs> No, I'd let Stanislav, like, if we don't hit anything, no, I wouldn't hit anything, but we're not going, we haven't given it a command to go anywhere. So right, this is the one these weird Soviet elevators that you press. Yes! Forward. Yes! Does he? Okay, what button is for the foot? Alright. There we go. <laughs> Maybe that happened when my kids were little. Maybe we'll go upstairs by walk because I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that yeah. we will go there. Uh, yes. Okay. Go, 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 go. Because we uh, should have some problem. Let's go upstairs. Let's take the stairs. <laughs> it is possessed. Yes. So we'll work our way up this stairwell to uh, the 20 meter elevation and get off uh, there to go visit the central hall. Um, this is uh, our escort here, Stanislav Shekstilo, uh, the long term employee here in the information department at uh, JNPP. He's uh, He's been here since the days that this was an operational nuclear power plant. He's been he's been very good to us. We uh, <laughs> we uh, frustrate him sometimes. I think uh, asking to do things like uh, oh visit the elephant's foot and things like that. He's uh, he uh, plays right along. On the left here are going to be the compartments for the drum separators in this type of reactor. Uh, and then we'll come here to the anteroom to the central hall where people change clothes and so forth to work in the at the uh, reactor fueling phase. Um, so we'll come on in here. There's some radiation detection gear because the central hall is a uh, fuel handling area and is uh, potentially radioactive. Um, there's a bench for changing boots and gloves and so forth. I'm not going to uh, show you the whole process because it's pretty boring watching people put on boots and, and gloves, but uh, we'll uh, speed up here and then look at some other stuff once we go in. Uh -huh. So, and also, respirator. So be attentive, please, during our, so uh, being here in the reactor <coughs> hall, be very attentive, please, usually, as usually. Yeah. Yes. So that's why. It might be backwards. Uh -huh.
Glass. Yeah. Glass. So we're heading in. The central hall is not only a contamination area, but also a giant hot cell for fuel handling because when the fuel's out, it's, uh, it produces a lot of radiation in this area. So you'll note we go through this little dog leg of concrete that acts as radiation shielding and uh, then we'll step into the uh, central hall itself. And here we are. Like this, and uh, I'll ask him to switch off the light. Oh, yes. спасибо. Спасибо. Ah. Да, спасибо. Если наша помощь нужна, пожалуйста. Я понял. Yes, я вас. Look at that fuel handling machine. Fuel. Oh. Oh. Like a rock. The RBMK reactor is constructed from uh, graphite blocks that are penetrated vertically by pressurized tubes that carry the nuclear fuel and uh, other in-core devices like control rods. And what we're looking at here is the top plate of the reactor where it's been penetrated by all of these channels. And uh, there is a protective heavy metal cap over each of the channel penetrations to protect it from mechanical damage. The uh, reactor is empty right now. There's no fuel. It's all been taken out. And there's also no water. So actually, there is a little bit of radiation up here, and it's due to uh, radioactive uh, material down in the channels. Yeah. Uh, and the radiation is streaming up through the empty channels and uh, up to the fueling face where we are now. Over here on the side are a bunch of heavy steel plates that cover up the steam water pipelines from the upper part of the reactor and uh, they will go under the wall on either side of the central hall and uh, bring steam to the drum separators. Over here are some caps for the uh, technological channels. They're a little bit radioactive just because of their proximity to uh, you know, dirty stuff, but uh, they again provide mechanical cover to the uh, to the channels up here on the uh, core face. We're going to go ahead and pass between the two spent fuel pools. There is no fuel in these pools. It's all been taken out to ICEF one. Um, what you see there, we'll take another look at later. Those are uh, what I call stringers. They're the uh, holders for things that are inserted into the technological channels. It's all back there. Oh, wow. And there are some other ones. These are presumably not used. Uh, they're not being held in the uh, in the spent fuel pools. But you can see the little fixture by which the refueling machine grabs the stringer and, and pulls it out. And ordinarily there would be fuel on the other ends. There's two, three and a half meter long bundles end to end. And here's where fresh fuel is stored in preparation for use. Uh, also down at this end of the reactor hall is the um, the transfer corridor for fuel. It's just to our left here and uh, this is where new fuel is brought up from below uh, when it's shipped in and also used fuel can be taken out in a cask. Uh, good view here of the, the uh, the stringer assemblies, this is the top end of the stringer where the machine would grab it. We'll go take a look at some other stuff uh, and here in the uh, central hall. So I'll go ahead and cut the, uh, cut the clip here. This is the spent fuel storage area in the number two reactor. And I want to be clear, there is no fuel remaining here. In fact, there's no water in the pool at all. What we have in the pool now are the upper uh, assemblies, the 
the stringer assemblies that would hold fuel in the technological channel if you had uh, the fuel in there. But uh, these stringers are obviously, as I said, not loaded with fuel. But they are radioactive, uh, which stands to reason because they're so close to the operating parts of the reactor. And so Lucas has called me over with the ion chamber to uh, look at a hot spot he found here. And uh, we're going we're gonna to see just how hot it is. And that's the one right there. You'll notice all of these stringers have a, uh, a nose on them, a little uh, catch that the refueling machine can grab onto in order to drag it out of the channel. It's really, uh, it's quite a clever way of uh, doing things. Incredible. And this spot right here that we're measuring, um, we're measuring two rentgens per hour. And, you know, this is a power plant that's known for having a lot of spicy stuff around. So two rentgens really not that high, but it's something. And this is, I should be clear, this is very localized. This is not coming from the bulk of all of these uh, these stringers that are parked here. It is um, it's some sort of fuel flea or just a local bit of leakage or contamination on that one spot. And uh, so yes, the dose rate's a little bit high, but it's at least as far as this power plant is concerned, it's it's really not much at all. Stanislav, how many times have you been in, in here? Many? Yeah. Is it okay if I walk up on the scaffolding now that everyone is down? Spasiba, Spasiba, this is incredible. Oh, this, this one right here? Yes. So now we're going to go up and look at the uh, refueling machine operator's room. And as mentioned before, the central hall of these reactors is basically a large hot cell because when spent fuel comes out of the core into the uh, refueling machine, there's a lot of radiation in here. And so the operator sits in a little booth behind a leaded glass window, and we'll go take a look at that shortly. But uh, right here while we're up and have a, up on the balcony and have a good look down at the core, I'll just mention a few things. There are about uh, 2,000 penetrations vertically through the RBMK core, and some 1,700 of them carry uh, nuclear fuel. These are the so-called technological channels. And, uh, and then we have about 200 more that contain control rods of various types. Uh, the control and protection system uh, has rods that descend from the top of the core. It has short absorber rods that come from the bottom of the core. There are rapid uh, shutdown rods, the BAZ system rods that come from the top. And there are uh, there are regulating rods as well as emergency uh, shut down rods in multiple systems. It's really quite a complicated arrangement. And in this reactor at least, and in the number three unit at, uh, here at Chernobyl, w one channel that belongs to the control and protection system has actually been set aside for, uh, radi uh, for neutron doping, activation doping of uh, silicon. And we saw that channel uh, in uh, the control room. It's uh, its um, uh, servo indicator indicated that it was being used for silicon rather than a normal control and protection system channel. And um, here in the photo you can see exactly uh, which one that is. Now we're going to go into the booth here where the refueling machine operator sits and you can see 
the window that that operator looks through when he's when he's working So Lucas is getting photographs of literally everything in here. And now we'll head back out through the shielding maze, back out onto the uh, platform here. And this is a good view of the central hall. In the distance behind the reactor, we have the two spent fuel pools on the left and on the right. And then behind them, along the central axis of the room here is the fuel transfer corridor which is a round hole in the floor and uh, it is through this hole that fresh fuel is loaded into the central hall and ultimately uh, the spent fuel is is uh, taken out in casks anyway I think that is a good overview of the uh, reactor fueling face in Chernobyl Unit 2. This reactor has been offline since the uh, since the accident in 1991 that um, that basically destroyed all of its uh, its number four generator and its its feed water pumps and it was a political decision not to restart the number two reactor but to leave it shut down and it's been that way ever since so the history of this place even though the lights are on and it's quite uh, quite pretty in here. This this has been a shut down nuclear reactor since before the Soviet Union came apart. So there are many people alive who uh, who have been alive for a shorter period of time than this reactor has just been sitting here. And um, so in the nuclear decommissioning business, things take a long time. And uh, the number two reactor uh, here at Chernobyl has been just sitting in this defueled state now for for quite a long time <laughs>